this week. We interview not one, but two, no three, no, well, a whole bunch of our friends from InGuardians. We'll experiment with a new format and talk about some enterprise security trends and advice. Security News for this week covers more SSL fail, security is about trust, duh, ransomware targeting WordPress, and so much more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. The SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Pony Express, check out their line of penetration testing devices including the Pone Pad, the Pone Phone, and the Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Welcome, everyone, to Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. I'm flying solo in studio, but I've got some very special people on the lines via Skype, and you can interpret special however you like. <laughs> Mr. Carlos Perez is here with us. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Mr. Joff Thayer is here with us tonight. Welcome, Joff. Yeah, hey, Paul. Good to be here. Love the creds, by the way, at the beginning of the show. Awesome. Oh, New thank changes. you very much. Yes, uh, we worked very hard on that. Well, mostly my production staff worked very hard on it, and I just yelled at them all the time. So, <laughs> Mr. Michael <laughs> Santarcangelo is here with us. Welcome, Michael. So he's going to be part of the rave. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll introduce our, our other special guests just after a couple of quick announcements. I want to mention InfoSec World 2016 returning to Disney's Contemporary Resort April 4th through the 6th. I'll be there presenting. Lots of other people that you may recognize will be there presenting. It's going to be great fun. Check out InfoSec World 2016. Hey, Paul, and, can I just yeah. mention that I'll be there the day before for the Leadership Summit? Oh, nice. So you'll be there on the third. Well, I'm not sure when I'll be there. My, I'm actually traveling out the Friday before. Oh, really? I'm doing some cigar stuff in Tampa or okay. some other. Okay, when, when you come into Orlando? And then I think Monday morning I come to okay. Orlando. Sunday, the day before, yeah. is the CISO Leadership Conference. Okay. And they've, they asked me last year to host it. So I've actually been... Nice working for the last year and putting together a, a leadership conference the day before. And then I'll be there when you get there. I'll carry your bags up to your room for you. But just so we're clear, I'm, I'm stopping at the door. I'm not going past the door. <laughs> Damn it. I mean, I like you and you trimmed up. It looks nice. Thank but. you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So another big announcement that you might have seen on uh, social media or the blog today is I have left Tenable Network Security. I am uh, no longer an employee there. Actually, February 19th, I'm no longer an employee there. And we've been putting together this uh, special announcement. I have accepted the position as CEO of Offensive Countermeasures, a new company that John Strand and myself uh, founded. It's a software security company. We've got lots of cool stuff going on. Now, we're very early stage. Now, it's very exciting. I love what I'm doing. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, doing, thank awesome. you. Thank you. I've been doing it for a couple of weeks. Uh, but it's very early on in the process. I wanted to give it a quick mention on the show and just talk about... Um, you know, that change in my career, which is, uh, you know, it's bittersweet. I, I loved working for Tenable, um, but this opportunity presented itself. And, you know, I've been working with software since I was like seven. So I thought it fitting that for my midlife crisis, rather than going up and buying a car, I'd start my own software security company, which is very interesting. <laughs> so you can go to offensivecountermeasures.com. 
You can check out a little bit of information about our products. It's kind of like a teaser. You can sign up for a beta. Now, I do want to caution you, not everyone is going to qualify for the beta program. Like I said, we're still very early stage. We're working very hard, very diligently to uh, get our products to market so that more people can use them. Uh, but I am looking for people who are interested in, uh, in beta testing and giving us some feedback. So that's what's happening now. You'll hear a lot more about that as uh, we progress uh, as a company. And, you know, there's some extraordinary people at Offensive Countermeasures, and I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, you know, part of the team and, and helping lead the charge. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. Yes. Big change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, Our good I friends. Like, I feel like a round of applause is required there. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Here's one. There it is. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you. Come on around. Thank you. <laughs> Our good friends from In Guardians have joined us on the lines via Skype. I thank you for your round of applause, and I thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Um, so uh, Larry is there with them. So Larry, say hello to everyone. Welcome, Larry. Hi. And now, Larry, why don't you introduce all of your coworkers, who most, for the most part, have all been on the show? I believe, maybe, is that Jimmy in the background? Yeah. Okay. You grew your hair longer since the last time I saw you, Jimmy. It looks fabulous. I would love to run my fingers through it. But Larry, why don't you introduce everyone uh, from your team? Right. So to my right is uh, Mr. Mike Poor. Uh, immediately to my left is Jimmy Alderson, followed by Jay Beal <laughs> and Mr. John Sawyer. Hey, guys, welcome uh, back to the show. For the most part, I think uh, most of you have been on the show before. Um, and this is really exciting. I'm so glad that uh, you could join us uh, this evening. So um, why don't we, um, how do we want to get started? Um, why don't we go, I, I want each of you to kind of give uh, an introduction for yourselves. Talk about, you know, what you've been working on, you know, what you do at the company kind of thing. Um, so I'll start from left to right. So I'll start with Mr. Mike Poor. Uh, well, I'm, uh, Mike Poor, I've been, uh, uh, well, involved in this company since the beginning. Uh, we've been around for 13 years. Uh, and I started uh, the company with some very, very close friends of mine. Uh, Jay and Jimmy are, are right here, and uh, Ed Scotus, Bob Hillary, uh, Eric Cole uh, all uh, uh, took part in, the, in this little venture. Uh, so it's, it's really great to see uh, you starting off uh, with uh, your newest edition of Paul, so we're all really excited for that. Thank you. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I teach in Intrusion Detection for SAMS. Uh, and uh, my primary focus on my job is on large-scale breach detection and analysis. And at the company, uh, I'm kind of like a wartime consigliere, uh, you know, from Godfather. So uh, yeah. I, I, I come in during special operations to handle specific tasks that need them. So not quite the cleaner or the wolf, but right, uh, right. definitely consigliere. Excellent. Jimmy, why don't you go next? So, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Jimmy Alderson, and I've also uh, been with Guardian since its inception uh, 13 years ago. Uh, it's been quite a long ride, a very interesting one. Um, I, uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, business activities, I'm the CEO, which means that I, I talk to a lot of CISOs. I talk to a lot of uh, uh, technical champions inside of organizations. Uh, I, I, I try to keep a pulse on things that are going on, and, and occasionally I, uh, I end up getting out the, the, the shell code myself. So. Um, Anyhow, uh, I run sales a lot. Uh, I work with, uh, with with Jay, who runs operations, I work with project management, and uh, all around uh, um, do it all type of thing. So he spends a lot of his time on the phone. Right. <laughs> Excellent. I'm noticing that as CEO, you do spend a lot of time on the phone. <laughs> Jay Beal, welcome back to the show. Hey, hey. Um, my name is Jay Beal. I uh, like uh, like Mike. I also teach a class. Uh, I teach a class uh, at Black Hat in the CanSec West on locking down the next systems. And, uh, and I've been teaching that class for somewhere around 15 years now. So it's sure evolved a lot. We're not telling anybody, telling anybody to turn off Tumblr anymore. Mm. Um, and we're starting to TCP backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, we're the, the most fun lately has been going into um, SE Linux and AppArmor, and then also into combining that with containers, with container systems like Docker or just the Linux kernels containment uh, container code. And so, anyway, that's what I do in my teaching time uh, at work. I am uh, uh, the chief uh, the chief operating officer, which means I've got my hands in damn near everything we do. Uh, 
keep it all working um, and uh, solve all the interesting problems. It's, uh, it's, it's the most fun freaking job because you're basically looking around for what can you make better and then ideally get the hell out of the way as fast as you can and, and uh, start scanning the environment again, which suits my personality plan. Awesome. John Sawyer, how are you? Hey, Paul, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Good, good. So I, I've been doing a lot of different things uh, lately, just pretty much anything you can describe that falls into pen testing or red teaming type work. Uh, we've been doing it. Spent a lot of time doing mobile uh, app research lately, some assessments and API work, which has been fun, kind of uh, evolved into a little bit of IoT type work. And then uh, most re recently, uh, diving head first back into incident response and helping some clients with some interesting uh, situations they found themselves in. Cool. Now, Larry, I want, why don't you talk about what you do for InGuardian since uh, we don't really you know, talk about that all, all that much on the show. Sure. So I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it is that I do here. Um, <laughs> but I do a whole lot of stuff. Um, uh, ideally, uh, when it comes down to day-to-day, -to -day, uh, we do pen testing, much of the same stuff that John was talking about, and all of the traditional type of stuff. Uh, my, my area of focus often is... Uh, in the energy sector, uh, doing hardware analysis, uh, hardware hacking, and a lot of uh, wireless related, whether it be Wi-Fi or other uh, radio-based signals. Uh, so we do uh, a fair amount of that as well. Um, however, uh, I moved into a little bit more of a, a management role uh, recently in that uh, I'm here to help uh, Mike, Jay, and Jimmy to sort of keep the wheels on the ground and, and make sure folks know where they're going. And, um, reviewing a lot of reports and doing some customer interaction uh, where appropriate, uh, as well as uh, just most recently uh, leading up all of our uh, research efforts. Um, and so that most recently has been into the, the IoT space. Very uh, nice. And, and HR. <laughs> and HR. I, God bless you, Larry. I would not want that job at that company. <laughs> or maybe, yeah. maybe I would. Maybe there's not much to do with HR because everyone seems to get along. Maybe too well at sometimes. Mike yes. looks really relaxed. So I see your back rubs have been paying off. It's good. It's good. Um, so I wanted to, uh, since we have this illustrious panel, uh, and you know, I, I know all of you personally, and we've you know shared thoughts about security over the years. So this is a really cool opportunity for me because I kind of get this idea for I don't know if it's going to be a new segment or a new show. I'm not quite sure where to go with it, but I wanted to test it out. And who better of a panel to test this idea out on than you folks? So I call it Enterprise Security 5 Questions. And we start out by choosing an area of security solutions. Uh, and we can choose firewalls, endpoint protection, threat intel, AV, IPS, WAFs, you know, whatever you want, whatever you're most comfortable talking about. Um, you know, pick one. And after that, I've got the remaining four questions, which are basically, you know, what's the evaluation criteria? How can I best use this in my security <coughs> program? What are the limitations? What are the strengths? And who are the major players in this space? Now, we don't necessarily have to say who we like best, um, but I think a lot of times people are either like, I didn't even know this space existed, right? And then they're like, so who are the vendors in the space to even start evaluating? So we're not saying, hey, go buy that vendor's product, right? We're giving you the background, the evaluation criteria, and we're saying, you know, these are the people that we know of the, to, to look at. And it's not going to be 100%. I mean, there's new companies that sprout up all the time, such as the one that I'm creating. Um, but I thought this was a, <coughs> excuse me, a really good exercise for all of us to go through, and our listeners, I think, are really going to benefit from it. So having said that, who would like to pick the first topic? This is part of the fun. Okay, Mike Poor is going to choose the first topic. Mike. So what I thought we could do is focus on perimeter protection and detection. And I'm specifically saying it in that realm because uh, we've seen the evolution from back when uh, Marcus Ranum wrote Deck Seal, like the first filtering router, to then uh, when he wrote the first packet filtering firewall with TIS uh, toolkit and V1, mm -hmm. uh, and then Gauntlet came around, then NFR came around to do layer seven inspection because we couldn't do that in real time anymore because of speed, bandwidth, and other, other criteria. To then, so that spawned kind of the first offline IDS, to then Marcus Random once again, you know, uh, coming up with layer seven firewalls, which are essentially IPSs, 
to then IPSs and then next gen firewalls. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a huge kind of conglomeration or, or grouping, but we've we've kind of periodically gone from like a router that does nothing to a router that blocks to a firewall that blocks and a router that routes to then uh, a, a firewall that only does like you know layer up to layer three, for instance, and then uh, your I IPS essentially doing the layer seven stopping and then eventually last otherwise. So well, why don't we talk about the perimeter and mm -hmm. those technologies and then we can talk about kind of IDS, IPS, next gen firewall. Does that work? Yeah, I like that a lot. So what what do you what technologies should we look at um, and what evaluation criteria should we have for them when we talk about protecting my perimeter, right? I mean that's the one commonality. Our goal is to protect the perimeter. I think it's good. We've established the goal. What what am I looking at? Am I looking at like one device to do everything, or well, don't am we I... first have to start by defining the perimeter? I mean, is, there's a there's an, isn't there a movement now that says the perimeter is not what you think it is? I mean, look at all the devices we have and all the applications and all the places we store data. Mm -hmm. sure. so is, is that a valid is that a valid thing no, to that ask? Is valid, we're going to say yeah. we're going to stick with the, uh, the more traditional perimeters. Uh, I think that just for the sake of the argument. Uh, we can stick with a very generic definition of perimeter uh, because it could be perimeter of the, of the data or perimeter of your network uh, or perimeter of an enclave, for instance, but it's still going to be a perimeter device. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and, 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 you know, we, we've, been, we've been looking at the decentralization, deperimeterization of the network for many, many years, um, but, you know, I, I think that leads you to talk about endpoint security and a bunch of other stuff, and I think that, that if we just think about perimeter, whether you want to call it traditional or not, um, it, it, I think it'll still apply. Yeah, because I think everyone has a, a network perimeter. Now, you may have an instance of a cloud, and you obviously have users that travel outside of your environment and applications, but I think one of the commonalities is we all have some still some uh, remnants of a network perimeter. Is it a large gallon of lube behind you? Yes, it is. It's a 55-gallon drum of passion lube. Which we actually recorded. We recorded a commercial for Passion Lube. We have the audio. I've yet to record the video because I'm kind of frightened as to what. <laughs> will, 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 it, will it have unicorns and pooping ice cream? It it could. It could. Okay. That's that's one of the, my favorite commercials of all time. But yeah, I you know what? I'm just waiting for Larry to come back in studio before we record the commercial. Will it be live action? It will be live action. Yeah, we'll. Uh, I'll show you some of the sample commercials we've done. Okay. So anyway, back to the perimeter. We're talking. So, Paul, Paul, speaking of that, speak, speaking of uh, the, the live action and the, and the thing a little bit in the back. The, the key thing about the perimeter that I that I find is that it's just like with applications. It's where the interfaces are. Whenever your people who are inside your organization are interfacing with the outside world, that's that's your perimeter. That's the place where people can come in and take advantage of it. Be it uh, at the traditional network. Outside of an EMZ, be it uh, via email that they happen to get someplace else, be it their mobile phones, whatever that is, the interface between them and the outside world is, is really that that perimeter. And that's where they get more. Yeah. So, I, I, but I like that, Jimmy, because it kind of helps us focus, right? So your interface to the out into the outside world. Now, what's the evaluation criteria? If I'm, let's say, I'm a medium-sized company, I'm a large company, and I want something new, something fresh to, you know, protect the perimeter to my outside world. Um, what's my evaluation criteria look like today? So, so a, a, a couple of things that, that are going to play a big major role in, in deciding that uh, is what risk are you trying to thwart, right? Mm -hmm. So identify those risks uh, and then model the threat. Uh, then when, when customers come to, to Wingardians and say, look, we have a SOC, we, we bought this technology, or we, we want to test this technology out, then uh, it, it, it's going to go through a couple different different stages. First is that evaluation criteria, like uh, I, I've narrowed it down to these three products, two I can afford, and one is the golf buddy of the CEOs I got to yep. talk to, too. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, and tr traditionally, what a lot of, of companies in the U.S. do, will take that gear and put it in production. Uh, and, and the biggest problem with that is that it gives you absolutely no control. So you have you have no goals, no criteria to evaluate against. You have no uh, no failure rate to measure against, and so forth. Uh, so uh, I would say you know traditional testing in a, in a, in a staging environment uh, where you take real traffic, where you take uh, exploit traffic, where you take 
uh, self-generated traffic and run it through uh, and see how the devices handle that. Uh, but more importantly is when you actually get these things into position, uh, you know, have it be something that's effective that your people can use. And then uh, set up a test where everything is planned. So it's a completely canned test where uh, if you're worried about a client-side exploitation and then pivoting laterally and grabbing a file off a network server and exfiltrating it, then let's model that exact threat. Let's get IP addresses, times, ports, uh, the exploit that we're going to click on, uh, you know, and how it's all going to go down. Give that to the SOC team, write up all of it down, come date and time, do that exact same test. And then have the SOC team explain what happened with the logs to the commensurate level of detail that they require. And if they can't tell you a story that they know, then they can't possibly tell you a story they don't know yet. So that's kind of like a, a starting point of like, do you get it? And do you get it at the, at the device layer? You know, did it capture it? Did it have the signatures? Did it log it in a format you can digest? Did you get that you know, in position to you in a format that you can process and, and in, within reasonable time, for instance, and react to it? Uh, and then do you, know, do, you have, do you get it organizationally? Do you have the standard operating procedures uh, and other things in place to digest that information, take the action, uh, and kill it? You know, like uh, uh, the database admin recognized you know, that, that query running under his name that he didn't start. He stops it, he reports it, they investigate, and they, sh they, they shut down. Yeah, and it's interesting, Mike. So what, what you're saying, and it's, it's funny because I give the same advice to people no matter what technology they're adopting. And I say, look at, like, what your processes are today. Like, what's your process first? Who's involved? What's their role? And what are your goals for this part of your program? And once you have that, well, then start go looking for solutions. You know, I mean, we can take this model and apply it. I like it because you can apply it to anywhere, like with web applications. They're like, well, what software should I get? I'm like, well, what technologies do you have? Well, we have a lot. Well, figure out which ones are most important and what technologies they have and what the teams look like and what their roles are going to be in your security process. Figure all that stuff out first. Then go hire a consultant or go, you know, do an evaluation and figure out what you want. I like that, Mike. And that's, and that's exactly – that's, that's – uh, in, our, in the course of our consulting work, that's constantly what we're seeing are tools that have been bought. Sometimes they've been deployed and, and more or less forgotten. They haven't been configured or not, there isn't a process. There aren't really good thoughts yet around, wait, what was our goal in buying this? What, are, what, do, we, what do we need to have? Um, and just treating, honestly, treating each product as, as, a, as a project. I think that really... If you think about it, at the end of the day, whatever the cost to buy the product was is actually the cheapest part of the proposition. You're going to spend a lot more money in terms of the time that you take, and you should, um, if you want to make that product effective and useful and have to even know how to measure whether it is useful. And I think one of the themes I hear uh, both of you saying is have a process in place to, before you buy it, how are you going to monitor it? So that when you buy the solution, you can ask them, well, we want to monitor it this way. Like, does your product even support that level of monitoring? How are we going to monitor the solution to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do? Well, and how do they tie both of them together? Because a lot of times, if we get a new client that comes in through the instant response or something like that, a lot we haven't had a chance to give them any kind of recommendations or any kind of security architecture reviews or anything yet. So we're, we're seeing their network for the first time, and we'll ask them questions about stuff that's going on. Again, you know, between that interface between them and the outside world, and they may not know where the logs are. You know, to Jay's point, in the, 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 the products are already there, you know, and, and to Mike's point, they don't know what's on there because they can't see it, you know, they're not being able to monitor it. Uh, they might have the, the Palo Alto firewall in there, but they're not bringing the logs back and looking at it. And you ask the question, like, well, what's this, what does your tracker look like? They don't know the answer. They can't answer it within 20 minutes. They don't have proper amount of visibility. Um, so you can have that continuous monitoring. So you can actually figure out what is going on between the inside and the outside world. Uh, and to particular levels of details, I can log those. And what solutions do I have in place right now that I could get more information out of mm -hmm. if I just took the time to configure them properly? Yeah, it's it, interesting. We're, we're combining the evaluation criteria and how do I best use it in my security program, right? It's almost like we need to flip it. You need to understand where it fits in your security program first and how it fits before you develop the evaluation criteria. What are, what are my goals? What am I, like, like we've been saying, what am I trying to achieve? Um, and how am I going to do that? And then how am I going to figure out whether I did do it? And you, you, you know, Paul, I think ahead, uh, 
I think also the, uh, the part of the evaluation criteria needs to be, um, you know, did this acquisition actually benefit my processes as well? Not just, not just is the technology effective, but as it benefited me as an organization in terms of fitting in, enhancing, and actually... Yeah, how do I uh, measure ROI? Yeah, as, is it giving me... That's what I was looking for. Is it giving me the return on investment from, from a people process perspective as well as the technology effectiveness? Mm -hmm. No, I agree. <laughs> So where, where can we draw the boundaries around perimeter protection today? I mean, because there are a lot of vendors that I think will promise a lot, but is that really what they're providing? And then there are some point solutions that maybe there's some gaps in. So like, how do we like draw a box or circle around what, what uh, strengths come from perimeter protection? Uh I, I think the first thing that we need to do is well, we need to define essentially the different aspects of perimeter protection that we're deal dealing with today, right? Because you know when uh, when we're looking at, at, at routers and switches, you know, providing you know ACLs, VACLs, uh, and, and so forth, then then move into IPS and IDS using signature engines and other things to, to detect and or block. Uh, we, we have a, a problem in terms of bandwidth and I.O. processing that keeps happening. So uh, the IDS, for instance, uh, was offline because inline, it couldn't process the data fast enough. Uh, inline IPS, we have a, a small modicum of the signatures that you have in IDS because if you have a false positive in an, in an IPS, you block legitimate traffic. And, and now with, with IDS and next generation firewalls, what you're having is you have a situation where the detection engine, for instance, detects JavaScript, but it can't continue to process the JavaScript in line at speed. So it continues to process data and it hands the JavaScript off to a JavaScript analyzer. That JavaScript analyzer will analyze the JavaScript uh, and find out that inside that JavaScript looks like a heap spray. Uh, and then that'll hand it off to the heap spray analysis module that will say, yep, that's a heap spray. Uh, send this back to the IPS, send it back to the IDS, send it back to the central security policy management system uh, and let them know that this is a legitimate attack. So it, what we have to look at what's happening now, we have to look at it more holistically for the next five to 10 years because this technology is already here. Uh, and it's, it's up to the big giants, for instance, you know, like Cisco, for example, um, and I don't say Palo Alto because Palo Alto in itself isn't the giant. Whoever's going to come along and gobble up mm -hmm. this type of technology, you know, Cisco already did it with Sourcefire mm -hmm. uh, when, when Sourcefire was kind of, you know, potentially right about at the point where they were developing some interesting technology that may or may not compete with Palo Alto and, and FireEye and so forth. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're going to see those players that have a much bigger piece of the puzzle and or ability to interact with other devices, kind of like we saw with, with, with Checkpoint Sam a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you saw that I kind of grimaced when I said that. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but that kind of thing where you have multiple units all doing different parts of that perimeter protection all the way down to because you know, endpoint protection is essentially perimeter protection at the closest perimeter, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all going to come into play uh, and, and, and that we need to evaluate that. And, and even like the simplest things like capacity plan. So, you know, we say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're, we currently have a, you know, a 10 gig backbone. Where are we going to be in five years? You say, well, maybe double what we're at right now, you know, type thing. And in reality, when we look at it, in 2001 to 2003, we were going to giggy, right? Mm -hmm. We were at 30 to 50% saturation at, at, at 100 meg. Uh, and then by, by 2010, we were at 10 gig, uh, as like most of our clients had 10 gig backbones, right? Now, many of our clients have 40 gig multiplex backbones, and some of our clients have 100 gig multiplex backbones, right? So... Uh, that's not just doubling up every five years, right? It's much the opposite. So, uh, and, and, you know, if we look at our clients today, many of our clients that have 10 gig backbone today have the, the monitoring capability backbone, whether it's technology, people, process, and everything else, 
for one gig, right? Uh, you know, and, and one gig at, at like 50% saturation, you know, and 70% peak. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that that's an area that we really fall on in terms of like capacity planning and other things is that we rely on some vendor magic number of events per second or packets per second, and it somehow is sitting in the right hand quadrant of some magic, you know, industry analysts, uh, you know, view of the world. So therefore, let's buy that product. And you end up with the phenomenon where it's 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 easier to grow your network than it is to grow the people who manage and monitor that network. Yeah, are a lot of solutions their major weakness today, their ability to keep up with the bandwidth and the traffic? And I mean, can we limit that to like our perimeter traffic? So not just our backbone, but, you know, going to and from the internet. How has that grown and what should we look at as strengths and weaknesses of our solutions to deal with the amount of internet bandwidth that we have? Uh, 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 absolutely, and, and also to deal with the, the different exposure that we have to ICD6. And it, it's not just DOD compliant, you know, my, my thing has a stack that speaks IPv6, but that actually does something meaningful and monitors IPv6, mm -hmm. blocks IPv6, you know, or, you know, or, or, or otherwise. So who are the major players in this space? If I've got a, if I've got a company and I've got, you know, 5, 10, 20,000 users, and I want some kind of perimeter protection, who are the vendors that I'm looking at to provide some level of perimeter protection? I mean, above and beyond the, you know, basic Cisco router that I'm probably going to buy, right? Like, what, what do we do to, to go up uh, in the layers, go up in the stack, and provide some protection on my perimeter? So, you know, you still have two different ways of approaching this, right? You have the people who want to, to, to buy the appliances, buy the equipment, uh, manage the software, and do that all internally. Um, and then you have uh, some of the vendors out there and some, some companies that, you know, that, that want this that push it towards the cloud. You know, you go on the cloud side, you've got your vendors like Zscaler and stuff like that that are trying to provide, like, role filtering and email filtering and a whole bunch of stuff per seat, per person, no matter where they're at, uh, whether they be at the local public Wi-Fi or someplace else. Um, and then you have the other side where it's like, hey, I, you know, I really want to manage that inside because there is no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer someplace else, right? Um, so they want to have their hands on that. Now sometimes um, they may outpace their ability to manage it and hold on to it, and so sometimes I may be pushed into the cloud, but internally you still have your big players, like you know, your Cisco folks. Um, you've got your um, uh, you've got your, your fire eyes, you've got your Palo Altos, Palo Altos, um, et cetera. Yeah, and, and you know, Checkpoint, Fortinet, uh, the, um, I, 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 I'm most familiar with Sourcefire based on, you know, my, my time I spent there, which was mm -hmm. a decade ago, um, and, and continued, you know, friendship with the organization. It's kind of scary to say a decade ago. Is totally <laughs> but, but, but but the uh, the, the, the salt the, the salt in the beer doesn't doesn't deny, um, but that I, I like their approach of tackling it, and holistically sounds very hippie and cheesy, especially here in the Northwest. Uh, but but tackling it from the perspective that it's not going to be one device that's going to be the one device to rule them all. It's not going to be that that next-gen firewall or that IPS or that, that you know, uh, that three-in-one stereo, right? right. Uh, it's not going to be, you know, uh, the, what, what's going to solve your problem. It's going to be a, a combination of, of appliances and services uh, and, you know, it, it's like... Processes. We, we can call things by new names and call them IPSs, but they're really a, an application or a firewall. Uh, right, you know, you know, and they've been around since the last millennium, right? You know, you can call things cloud, but, you know, some of us have known that there's outsourced virtualization for a long time. And it's just, it's new technology and, and new ways to scale it, but, you know, a, a customer came to us and said, look, we have identified 121 different services that we use for our critical infrastructure of how we run our company that are all external to us. Whether it's Office 365, you know, and, and Dropbox, and like you know, these literally 121 different web-based services that that they identified that they essentially had to maintain access to for their their users internally to run their company, and yet they had no visibility into how their data was being attacked, how it was being protected, and otherwise. So 
you know, I, I think the cloud thing is a, a you know, a separate conversation. No, I, I, I agree. When, 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 when I look at, at purchasing anything, whether it be for my perimeter or, or an appliance or otherwise, uh, I want to look at how it integrates with the existing infrastructure of that organization, how they're going to consume and digest it, you know, for example. Um, I, I ran into an organization, this is not one of our clients, uh, this is actually an organization where one of my students works, uh, and they're a giant web 2.0 company, uh, you know, household name in, in our world and the business world otherwise today. Uh, and we were talking about uh, just, you know, net flow or network flow sampling. Uh, and they were doing a 1 in 10,000 event sampling hmm. at each of their system, at each of their, their endpoints. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're getting such a minute view of what they're really, of what's really going on network transaction-wise in the organization that, you know, my point was why even bother with that? What, you know, what is it in your compliance regulations or otherwise that is causing you to store that because it's not, it's not worthy enough, it's not really giving you enough, right? You know, and, and, and we all often talk with our clients and otherwise, you know, with the, uh, do I go with full packet capture or do they just stick with NetFlow, right? And, and these types of things. And, and we usually look at Bro, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of a great middle point between the dangers of full packet capture and, and the, you know, just paranoia generator that is net, net flow of data for example. <laughs> and, you know, another thing that's interesting is to think about is like how do you protect against certain things? Because we have a lot of endpoint protection that looks for certain types of attacks or signature types of things. But, you know, a lot of times what we'll see with incident response is, you know, attacks will come armed with something. They'll have a local administrator password and maybe a handful of user credentials uh, or, or, or something like that. And so the, the answer is, so let's just assume, don't say how to leave, assume they've got, you know, 50 user credentials and a local administrator password. How can you defend against that? Um, you know, do, is, it, is it logging and, and log aggregation and correlation with SIM, et cetera? Or is it also, you know, find those anomalies? Or, and it's also to say, well, how could somebody get in armed with that information? You know, where, where could they use that at? You know, do we use the same local admin across the, the way? Do they have access from the network? Is there some sort of like way to get in? But you know, find out how to protect against those. Yeah, you got all the you know new exploits and things like that. Um, also CNC stuff. But like, just somebody's got all your information, you know, credential wise. How do you detect that? How do you defend against that? So Paul, mm -hmm. back to number two, very very specifically, right? In terms of evaluation criteria, uh, I, I I would say that. The, the first three things that you need to do within the organization is uh, identify uh, the business units uh, and, and, and how that business is going to uh, be affected by those threats. Uh, second, identify the data you have. Uh, what data do I have and where is it at risk? Uh, and then uh, third, uh, do a profiling of your current risk and your current traffic. Uh, so. Uh, Network flow uh, using Silk, uh, uh, CERT, uh, or Carnegie Mellon, I should say, and, and uh, US CERT have put together a series of tools and papers uh, on how to do network profiling using Silk. Um, the uh, NetFlow, if you're a Cisco shop, or JFlow or SFlow, Argus, if you're an old school shop, uh, all have good ways of doing network profiling. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and there's always the fallback of, Wireshark statistics, you know, or spending a couple hundred thousand bucks on a Mazu box, right? But once you have that threat profile, right, the, the business risk profile and the network profile, uh, then, then you can kind of narrow down the types of products that are going to be, uh, you know, best suited to your environment. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, if, if you are a, an HTTPS heavy shop and one of your biggest risks is people using HTTPS to for command and control or exfil out of your organization, then you know, you're going to need to look for your perimeter, both detection and protection, the capability to decrypt outbound SSL. Right? So either that's going to be on the device itself, uh, so, uh, or you know, so you're using like a, a blue code proxy, an F5 box for Dallas, uh, right? uh, otherwise, um, or uh, you're going to uh, uh, use other tools and techniques, uh, uh, you know, involved. Uh, so, so, uh, so that that's going to kind of lay down your criteria for how you're going to uh, uh, choose which ones have the 
the capabilities that you're looking for. I want to uh, I want to talk about a, a specific example in this use case when we talk about perimeter protection. How is the challenge different in universities? Where I I believe having come from that environment, and John, I know you worked for a, a university as well. Uh, how do you deal with this problem because your internet bandwidth is typically so much greater than most organizations? What are some of the unique challenges and in, in what's available today in terms of uh, just overall good advice for universities to look at what's on the market today and maybe some specific examples? Well, the problem you find with universities is in, as opposed to an enterprise where you are expected to understand all the endpoints in your, in your network, you baseline them, you, you're providing protection for them. Within the university space, you've got a lot of endpoints that are completely unmanaged by the, the people that mm -hmm. are responsible for the security of the university. So it comes down to isolating a lot of those, those unmanaged assets into an environment where you can provide the monitoring and the controls and stuff to protect the other uh, university resources, the, more the crown jewels, that type of thing. And uh, what I've seen is compartmentalization kind of works best for them to be able to, uh, you've got your various departments, some of them will have you know, different types of sensitive data and they end up just kind of locking those down. And, and the politics, of course, gets in the way too when you start looking at a, a, a university environment because now you've got silos of power between you know, research versus academics versus you know, the business of the university itself. So. Um, I would yeah. say M mention full packet capture in the university environment and watch people just freak out. <laughs> oh yeah, full packet capture. Uh, anything that uh, starts looking at user behavior, like uh, proxy logs and that type of thing. I mean, anything uh, like that starts. You get academics to start crying uh, academic freedom, and, and researchers who do the same thing because I mean, sure, legitimately there are. Take them out. <laughs> send them home send them home yeah so um if i can make job. a comment there i you know I, I grew up in a in a large university environment as well and um that explains you know, a lot we, <laughs> thanks mike <laughs> we uh we eventually gravitated towards pretty heavy use of segmentation but the really the really difficult case for large universities is, is not only the full packet capture and the speeds and feeds which the researchers demand be high typically and when i left it was it would dual gig pipes out to the internet, and we were just a modest sized university. Um, but it's also the um, when you go down a, a route of, of decent segmentation, try to divide the the populations up in order to provide some sort of protections. Uh, the crossover cases and the politics around the crossover use cases is what gets you into real big trouble. And I lived and breathed it, and it was you know really quite a miserable experience. So um, that, it's a very challenging environment. So I, I, I think that uh, I've done a number of projects with universities, and, and, and in fact, uh, uh, Jocelyn met there originally a long time ago, and, and also in my class. But the the uh, in my experience, it's always been the academics, mainly the professors uh, uh, and, and folks managing endowments that uh, scream the loudest when you mention security firewalls or otherwise. Uh, and, and then when you point out that, you know, if, if we just changed 15 or 20 records in, uh, you know, essentially like medical research database, for example, uh, that, you know, all the research would be invalidated and, and, you know, the $2 billion worth of endowment that they were receiving just went out the window. Uh, th those things do change. So I, I think we need to separate that, you know, we have, you know, the staff of the universities, which are usually very capable, very technical, uh, very passionate people that want to solve the problem and fix the problem and, and work in a, you know, uh, first world uh, is not necessarily a good uh, uh, comparison or even enterprise, but they want to they want to do the right thing, right? Uh, and, and, you know, culture, you know, in, in some of these cases, you know, plays a, a role to, to block that. But regardless, you know, Paul, to your first point with universities, you have very hostile networks. Uh, you have extremely large bandwidth networks, right? You have um, many of the big research universities have Internet 2 and, and massive, you know, backbones of the Internet uh, with, without the products even existing on the market space to be able to monitor uh, and block it, even if that was possible, you know, from a cultural standpoint. Uh, the, um, you know, I, I remember 
you know, working with Berkeley, you know, for example, like 10 years ago, you know, and looking at both their internet too, as well as, mm -hmm. as their, their 10 gig pipe to the internet, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of like, what do you mean 10 gig pipe to the internet, right? You know, uh, first of all, I, I thought at the time that 10 gig was theoretical, like max limit for light speed, right? You know, <laughs> like, you know, well, yeah, now that's how we move data is light, so therefore we can do this. And I'm like, yeah, but, <laughs> right? And, and, and then we start looking at the fact that we didn't have taps that could do 10 gig. We didn't have, you know, heck, Cisco didn't put out a decent switch that did 10 gig until a few years ago. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, um, so so the, there's a lot of catch up there where they're leading the game. They're, they don't have the budget or in some cases the bailiwick to do the enforcement. Uh, but but other than that, I, I think that you have a lot of the same problems that you have in very big enterprise, where you have where you have silos uh, of non-cooperative, you know, users or suppliers, right? You have you know how many times have the people here gathered uh, heard or dealt with uh, the fact that the network group doesn't want to supply, you know, insert log here, whether it's syslog uh, forwarding or whether it's netflow forwarding or whatever the security group. So the security group goes and deploys caps and sniffs the syslog data or sniffs the 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 the, uh, the netflow data right off the wire and brings it into a collector. Um, so uh, I, I think separating out that kind of layer eight and layer nine politics, money, and, and mm -hmm. culture thing, um, I, I think that they're facing a lot of the same things that big companies are facing, where they've been pushed to, to maximum speed. Ludicrous speed, you know, and so forth, and they don't have the process, talent, or or, or technical capability of digesting ten percent of that bandwidth, right? You know, it's. I remember going to Japan in the early two thousands, two thousand three, two thousand four, teaching for Sam's, and here we are, in like one of the most technologically most advanced stations on earth, and they're all sitting with hundred meg hubs. Uh, right, and, and, and literally, you know, I kept looking, because you know, I was sure that somewhere I'd find a 10 meg hub. Uh, and, and, uh, and I was sort of like making fun of it, and I'm like, first of all, a lot easier to monitor a hub. Absolutely. Uh, second of all, like, <laughs> let's bring it back to 10 meg, and, and, and I can watch those packets all live, day long. Right, you know, matrix style, right? <laughs> so, who on the panel there has not played five questions with Security Weekly? At least a few of them. I, I don't know if John's played in a, played in a long time. I think John needs to play. All right, John. Here we go, John. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, I don't know. Uh, creative, fast, and... Uh, Giant, delicious tongue. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, no, come on. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Giant delicious tongue. <laughs> <laughs> no, hold on, guys. Will you let John answer? This is John's questions. <laughs> What's the next question, Paul? Well, if you were a serial killer, John, what would be your weapon of choice? Something blunt. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? The Misadventures of Me. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, um, Robert Redford and Jack Nicholas. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. now, Jimmy, Jimmy, you, ha you definitely have not played five questions, right? I have not played five questions. Okay, three words to describe yourself. Tall, creative, and hyper. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? The internet. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? It would be called A Long Strange Trip. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Um, I, I do like to go first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, yeah, so uh, Robert Redford as well, we're brothers, evidently. And um, uh, Robert Redford and... Sophia Loren. Excellent. You're half brothers. Uh, so for everyone, if you had to field a team in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, 
We all know they're played in teams of three. Who are your other two teammates in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby from left to right? Mike Poor, you go first. Uh, it would have to be Larry Pesce and Tom Wilson. Larry Pesce, who are your teammates in the game of Ask Grabby Grabby? Oh, wow. Who are my teammates? Um, Jim Carrey and uh, Johnny Depp. Jimmy? Wow. Um, oh, man, my teammates. Well, first of all, I, I definitely think Tom Liston would definitely make a great teammate. Um, and I'd have to go with John Strand. There you go. Jay Beal, <laughs> your teammates in Ask Grabby Grabby. Angelina Jolie and Johnny Leonard. John Sawyer, your teammates in Ask Grabby Grabby. Margarita Laviva and Larry. Excellent. I like how some of you chose each other. I thought there'd be more <laughs> choosing of each other to be on the app. But you guys all get to play Ask Grabby Grabby together all the time, which I'm sure you're going to probably do right, right after the show. I'd go for me, myself, and I. But... Yeah. <laughs> I, hey, Paul, I'm glad we got through that segment. With at least somebody mentioning Angelina Jolie. This is true. The, as Angelina Jolie has to come up. Yeah, well, guys, one. you're more than welcome to stick around. We're going to take a short break now. We're going to come back and do security news. Uh, so I hope you stick around. We're going to talk about the stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.